as we know, the value of any investment, whether or not it's stocks, bonds, projects, new businesses, is the present value of future cash flows. In order to compute this present value, we need to we need a discount rate. In this module, we're going to focus on what uh, what should this discount rate be. So we're going to take a look at um, the history of stock returns and bond returns. And then we're going to look at some models that help us estimate a discount rate so that we can use so that we can apply this discount rate when we compute present value of values for projects and investments. The basic principle behind the discount rate is that there is a trade off between risk and return. Um, the, most important fundament, fundamental assumption is that there should be a reward for taking risk. And the greater the potential reward, the greater is the risk that an investor must take. So this is the no free lunch hypothesis. And uh, common sense tells us that, that that should be the case. If you ask me to take, to take on an investment that is highly risky, I expect a greater payoff. So I expect a greater reward if I am asked to take a higher risk. We're going to walk through the definitions of return relatively quickly. Uh, most of these concepts are relatively straightforward. So first, we're going to talk about returns in dollar terms. So again, we want to focus on the, the two components of return. One is an income component, which is recurring. So as long as we own the asset, as long as we own the stock, the bonds, or the business, we'll continue to receive the income. Uh, on, a, on a recurring basis. And then the second component is when we liquidate our investment, when we sell off the stock, when the bond matures, or when we sell off the business, we'll, explain, we'll, ex, we'll expect to get either a, a capital gain or if we lose money, a capital loss. So let's take a look at a really quick, quick example. Let's say you bought a bond for $950, so that's your first that's your purchase price. You receive two, two coupon payments of $50, $30 each. So you receive a total of $60 in coupon payment, and then you sell the bond for $975 today. So altogether, this is, as I said, this is a pretty simple example. Two coupon payments, $30 each, that's $60. You sell the bond for $975, and you bought it for $950. So you make $25 on the bond. So $25 goes to capital gain, and the income is $60. So altogether, you will have a total of $85 in dollar return in this investment. Expressing dollar return is the first step, but a lot of times we want to express our return in terms of percentages so that it makes it easier to compare investment versus uh, uh, one investment against another. Um, so if you have a chance to invest in a stock, the stock price may be very different than the bond price of $950. So in order to make investment more comparable, a percentage return is a better approach. So to convert the dollar return into a percentage return, we, we use the denominator. We use the beginning price, meaning the investment that we put in in the very beginning. So our initial investment as the denominator. If we divide the income return by the price, uh, this is the income yield, or if this is a stock, uh, since the income from a stock will be the dividend, this is considered the dividend yield. And the capital gain or capital loss is the capital gains you. Again, we divide that by the beginning price. And the total percentage return is the income you or dividend you plus the um, capital gains you. So if you look at our last example, where when we compute our dollar return, if we were to convert this into an income, into a percentage return, we would divide this by the beginning price or the, or the in, initial investment. So that's $950. And that translates into a percentage return of 6.3%. So that is the income yield. And we can also do the capital gains yield again. We will divide that by the initial price, which is $950. 
So the capital gains yield is 2.6%, and then together the total return is 8.9% on this investment. So that will be our total percentage return. So a income yield of 6.3% and a capital gains yield of 2.6%. Here's another example for computing return, and this is a stock investment. So in this case, you bought a stock for $35, and you get a dividend of $1.25, and you sell the stock for $40. So in other words, if you buy the stock for $35 and you sell it for $40, you experience a capital gain, you make $5. In addition, you get $1.25, so altogether you make $6.25 in your investment. The percentage return, remember, we need to divide that by the initial investment, and the initial investment is $35. So the dividend yield is 3.57%, and the capital gains yield is uh, $5 on $35, or 14.29%. Your total return will be 17.86%. So you can use this approach, the total uh, computing dividend yield and capital gains yield, and the total return uh, for any stock. Um, you can also use this method to compute the annual return. So this will be the uh, beginning price. So again, if you are computing this um, every year, this will be the price at the beginning of the year, and this will be the price at the end of the year and with the beginning and ending price for each year and the dividend income that you receive over the year you can compute the annual return for a stock so where would you find the prices for the stock um, stocks are traded on stock exchanges and stock exchanges are part of the financial market so the financial market's primary job or primary role is to allow investors to buy and sell stocks. So financial market is a place where investors can exchange their, um, their needs for, for money. So a business that needs money, um, then they can go to the financial market to borrow money or raise money from the investors. Investors who have more than enough money from their current income and want to save for retirement will go to the financial market and buy stocks so that they can save their current income and earn a return in exchange for future income. So if a well financial functioning market, a well functioning financial market increases the utility for all investors. And the participants in the financial market includes governments, companies, individual households. So the most important part about the financial market is that it gives us information about the return that are required for different types of securities. So through the through individuals, every single individual investor's um, investment decision, meaning how much they are willing to pay to buy a stock or a bond, um, they then establish the required return for those securities. So financial market is where the information regarding companies get translated into prices. So let's take a look at what how the financial market has performed in the past, at least in the U.S. Uh, so here are different types of investments. T-bills is um, short-term government bills. So this um, um, borrowing by the federal government, very short term, usually between 30 days to 90 days. Um, and then longer term bond, uh, longer, longer term government bonds, and also um, large company stocks and small company stocks. So you will see that if you started with a dollar in 1925, that one dollar would have gone grown to $15,000 had you invested in small company stocks. Now you invested in large company stock, your $1 would have grown to $3,000. If you put that $1 in government T-bills, that would have gone to $20.56. We also need to take into account inflation because inflation affects your purchasing power. So something that you can buy for a dollar back in 1925, that same item would have cost you $12.59 by 2011. 
So if you're one, if you the one dollar, if you didn't invest it at all and keep it under your mattress and it stays at one dollar, by 2011, that one dollar will not be able to buy you the same thing that you could have purchased in 1925. In fact, to buy the same item in 2011, you will need twelve dollars and fifty nine cents. So putting your money in the mattress, you're actually losing purchasing power over time. The second thing that we want to learn from this graph is risk. The way that this graph demonstrates risk is the smoothness versus the jaggedness. So remember that um, you don't always start at the same point. So for let's take someone who is very unfortunate. Let's say someone starts saving money in 1925 and retires in 1935. In 1935, the $1 that they put into small stock would have gone down to about 20 cents. So you have the person who has invested the dollar in, 19, in 1925, when they retire in 1935, will only have 25 cents. And obviously, that's not enough for that. That that's actually a loss um, of most of it of um, her investment. On the other hand, had that same person invested in Treasury bill, T bill, it wouldn't. That person would not have lost much money. If you look at the the curve for Treasury bill, it remains steady, pretty much steady over time. And for the majority of the time, Treasury bill outperforms inflation, meaning that you are able to protect um, the your purchasing power. The only exception is during the 1940s and 1950s. This is the post-war period. But for the majority of the time, you will be able to keep pace with inflation or slightly better than keeping pace with inflation. So the starting and ending period is, is very important. Um, so the more jagged the line, the higher risk it is. And you can see the over time, what are some of the major um, decline in the stock market. So there's a major decline in the stock market and the overall economy back in the 1930s and again in the 70s. Um, and once again, more recently in 2008. So you can see when the market goes down. Notice that when the market goes down, the um, t bills return may not have gone up substantially, but it does not experience the same level of decline um, as uh, smaller uh, small company stocks or large company stocks. So this graph to us shows that how much one dollar will have increased by um, over this time period, and the jackedness tells us how. Um, how risky it is.